ten. Previously on Spirit Science. We fell, we hit rock bottom, and once again began a revolution from square one, only this time as a male species. It was a new beginning. Eventually, humankind had re-evolved to a state where they could understand new information, and the Nikals gave us a boost into civilization. Egypt and Sumer were born. Everything in ancient Egypt was synthetic. They had this entire civilization based around achieving heightened states of consciousness, but they had to do it through tools. Now, we're not gonna look at each of these tools individually, but let me give you a brief overview here. This tool was used for transferring vibrations into the body. Along with that were the hook and flail. This little device was a kind of generator to increase vibrations, though there's not too much information available on it. This thing, however, was their most important tool, the Ankh. They saw the Ankh as the secret to eternal life, and they used it not as a physical tool, but as an energetic one. They would use this form and onk their sexual energy. Now, this could be a huge topic on its own, like how energy travels up and down the body through a vertical tube between five energy channels that counter-rotate as they extend through the body. But basically, sexual energy is an incredibly powerful energy. We definitely abuse it today, but what the Egyptians knew was that when you had an orgasm, a very large amount of energy bursts from your root chakra all the way up your spine to the top of your head, and then it gets released. What the Egyptians would do was when the spiral of energy hit their heart chakra, they would onk the energy out of the back of their body and over their head and back into their body, where they would keep the energy and retain a massive energy boost. In other words, if you take a tuning fork and hit it, it will reverberate for a certain amount of time. Then, if you attach an onk on top of it and hit it again, it will reverberate at least three times longer. The Egyptians were doing this with their bodies. Moving on, when Atlantis was first formed, the Nikal set up something called a mystery school. This is a special type of school where you learn about consciousness and you learn different aspects of expanding your own consciousness and eventually getting to a place where you become immortal. It usually took a very long time to achieve this state and that's why there were only about 1,000 Nikals in comparison to the millions of Lemurians at the start of Atlantis. The first Atlantean to reach the immortal state was a man named Osiris. Ancient Egypt's mythology tells a story about Osiris, a man who was killed and cut up into pieces by his brother in an act of rage and then the pieces were scattered. This event, perhaps less exaggerated than the myths, actually did happen, and it took place on Atlantis. Osiris's wife and sister retrieved the pieces, and upon returning the final piece, they restored the creative energy flow and brought his spirit back into the body. Through doing this, Osiris became immortal, and he was the first immortal of Atlantis. This story is told throughout ancient Egypt on many temple walls, and I'm going to show you why. Osiris went through the three stages of consciousness. The first one was whole, the second was separated from itself, included physically, and the third was whole again. The Nikals used Osiris' understanding of how he became immortal as a template for how others could do it as well, only through consciousness, without needing to be cut up, of course. This eventually became what we would call the religion of Atlantis, but it was more of a deeper understanding that they were following. This template was also used in Egypt, which we will look at now. Through this stair-step evolution, we began to change from the first level of consciousness into the second. Before the fall, we had incredible memories. It wasn't this vague recollection that we have now, but today we might see it as full tilt 3D holographic memory. After the fall, we still had a photographic memory and could share these experiences with each other, which is called dream time. It is what the Aborigines of Australia still have today. Through the introduction of writing, however, we began to change from the first level of consciousness into the second. We lost our incredible memories and became very separate from each other and ourselves. Thoth was the one who introduced writing. And if you look at ancient Egyptian culture, it even says, Thoth brought writing to us, as well as many other things. Now that we were in the second level, over time, things began to change, and a very serious problem developed, which if it hadn't been solved, it would have caused a major catastrophe in our own near future. Basically, in Egypt, the Ascended Masters had used Osiris' genetic coding of changing chromosomes to show others the path of ascension. They developed a system of 42 and 2 gods, with a lowercase g. They were actually called Neaters. Most will recognize this one. His name was Anubis. There were 42 and 2 neaters who were representative of human chromosomes. Each one of them showed a specific pathway of life or human experience, and people would follow these understandings to learn more about their life or their own reality. The problem developed when both Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt became more separated from themselves, and the meanings of these neaters were lost. Over time, the drawings of these neaters changed, and the meanings changed with them. People had no idea what they meant. 
Then it got worse, when the Egyptian king Menes merged Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt into a unified country. Menes also merged the belief systems, so now you had 88 gods that people were fighting over to decide who was really god. This was an issue because now they had people not knowing what to believe, completely lost, separated from their understanding of their own divinity and god. Things became separated further, people fought over which gods were really gods. Today, we look back and say, wow, <laughs> they thought there were so many gods, when really, this wasn't the case at all. Even with the help from the Tat Brotherhood, we just couldn't get it right. There was one short period of Egyptian culture that most historians don't really understand. As it's written in ancient texts and hieroglyphs, for 17 and a half years, there was a bizarre new ruler that completely changed how Egypt was run. And his name was Akhenaten. Before him, there were only kings. Akhenaten was the first pharaoh, which meant that which you will become. He was also, believe it or not, 15 to 16 feet tall, at least that's how he was always depicted, and had an elongated skull. Both of these aspects are related to Christ consciousness. Akhenaten abolished all previous understandings of God and tried to instill a one God understanding in everyone. After 17 years, the majority of Egyptians revolted and Akhenaten was killed, soon to be replaced by someone else, returning to the old system. What actually happened? To correct the problem, Thoth got the help from Ai and Tia, who were the first immortals from Lemuria, and got them to mate interdimensionally to conceive a Christ consciousness being. Thoth said that he worked with the previous kings of Egypt to help achieve this, and Egyptologists find that Akhenaten came completely out of nowhere. It took some time, and there was a transitional period involving Amenhotep III, but soon Akhenaten was on the throne. Akhenaten used his time to bring Egypt back to a simple religion where there was one god, one reality. He used imagery of a sun disk to represent this. The priests in Egypt didn't like that because the religious beliefs were centered on the priests. Then he comes along and says, you don't need priests, God is within you, and you can access God from within your own selves. Well, they didn't like that. He also pulled the military back and said, don't attack unless someone else attacks first. The military didn't like him either. Plus, the people generally didn't like him because they enjoyed worshiping their many gods. Eventually, they disposed of him. After all that, what did Akhenaten do that evidently saved humankind? Well, he developed a mystery school with the intention of showing a small group of humans a way to ascend into the immortal state. Usually, it took hundreds of years to reach the level of immortality and Akhenaten had 17 years to produce results. This was a very close call, but he did it. He actually showed 300 individuals the path to immortality in this short time. So after the general population disposed of Akhenaten, these 300 immortals would go beyond Egypt. Both wrote in the Emerald Tablets that after ancient Egypt ended, he brought a man named Pythagoras into the Great Pyramid and taught him the geometry of the universe. That man then went on to found Greece, which was originally built upon schools for teaching geometry and the platonic solids and all of that stuff. Thoth lived a lifetime here as well, where he was known as Hermes Trismegustus. Akhenaten's immortals became a group called the Essene Brotherhood. They first migrated to a place called Masada in Israel. Even today, Masada is known as the capital of the Essene Brotherhood. Now get this. In this brotherhood, there were two people in particular, a man and a woman. You might have heard of them. Mary and Joseph? See, it was part of the Ascended Master's plan that they would bring in a being who would show the pathway to Christ Consciousness. He would come to Earth as a second level being, a regular Joe, and achieve Christ Consciousness through the course of his life. Then, the ascension process, the transitional experience from the second to third level, would go into the consciousness grid that was still being formed. He was able to transition because he was originally from these higher levels. That man is known today as Jesus, although his name at that time was Yahshua Ben-Hur. If Yahshua had not shown up, we would not have had that ascension experience available to us today. None of us would be aware that these higher levels of understanding even existed, and we would destroy ourselves. According to what Tho said, Mary and Joseph made it interdimensionally. Mary could have been a virgin, physically, but she made it with Joseph in a way that would allow a soul from a higher reality to come down to Earth and have a human experience. Usually, this is impossible to do otherwise. Through Yahshua's work, he came here just like us, a total human being, but he went through these three important stages, final death, resurrection, and ascension, and gave us these experiences so that we could access them down the road. Now, as we all know, the story of Jesus has a missing piece. He was a child, disappeared for some time, and then showed up again when he was 30. In a book called The 18 Absent Years of Jesus Christ, the leading theories about where he went was actually out east to either the Himalayan or Tibetan mountains, where he became an enlightened guru. He brought his teachings back to the world after that. If you remember from part one, the Kundalini of the planet was residing in Tibet at that time. They were very spiritually adept people living there, and remain so today. Now, on the topic of Christ, there's something else I'd like to bring up. The Lord's Prayer. Today, we know this as the only prayer that Jesus taught, but did you know it's actually a geometric prayer meditation? 
A man named Bodhi McCoy spent over 20 years working with this prayer and analyzing it with sacred geometry and has discovered some incredible synchronicities. In his book, Live the Promise, he explains how the original prayer, not the extended version, mind you, has seven segments or thoughts, which align perfectly with the seven chakras as well as the seven original branches of yoga. Bodhi teaches how to do this prayer meditation as well as meditations him and his wife have developed based on the Lord's Prayer called Heart Dances. It's really quite incredible to see how it all works with the pure geometries of the universe. If you wish to learn more, check out livethepromise.net. If you study Christian religion and Egyptian religion, you'll actually find that they parallel in almost every way except for the Egyptians' understanding of God. Most evidence shows that Christian religion came out of Egyptian religion, and then later they went back and discredited the Egyptians. Around 300 AD, there was a council called the Council of Nicaea, which was the syndication between the Roman political and religious authorities. Basically, the religious leaders and political leaders realized that they could unite and impose more influence on the people and control society through their unity. It's right around this time that we begin to see the manifestation of the New Testament, which was put together from scriptures and stories, some newer and some much older, which were renewed and superimposed on the life of Yahshua ben Hur, which today we know as Jesus of Nazareth. The term Christ actually stems back from much before the Bible. It comes from the word Christala, which is a word that derives from the original seven core audible sounds of creation. When the creation of the universe occurred, the original tones were Ka, Ra, Ya, Sa, Ta, Ha, La. Christla actually was broken down on earth into two words, Christ, which soon became Christ, and Hla, which became Allah, which were broken down and changed through oral tradition. The symbol for Atlantis was three rings inside of the other. The inside were the Nikals, the middle ring were called Maya, and the outer ring were the Atlanteans. The Maya's job was communicating the messages from the inner circle out to the regular people of Atlantis. When Atlantis sank, the Maya took their knowledge, a crystal skull with memories of Atlantis and their calendar, and went out to what today is called the Yucatan Peninsula, birthplace of the Mayan civilization. Their calendar is the most advanced, detailed calendar on the planet, and it has its roots in Atlantis. Over the last few hundred years, a group of people have slowly monopolized the entire world into what it is now. Today, there are 13 families that are among the richest families in the world. They have their hands in next to every organization and government and control over 95% of the money. They control our modern world from the very tippy top. Today, we like to call them the Illuminati, except that's not really who they are. The word Illuminati means enlightened ones, which was established long ago as a secret society that was focused around expanding knowledge through scientific and spiritual understandings. Secret societies were not originally bad, but rather consisted of those who just kind of got it. They understood information that the average person at that time would not accept and demonize. These societies had to be kept a secret because of the control that the church had and refuted against what they wanted to explore. This is where Freemasonry originally comes from. If you do the research on the time periods, what probably happened was that the church who had the majority of the control at the time probably infiltrated some of these organizations to make sure that they were not creating plans to expose information and destroy the world order that they had created. This led to the church exposing some of the societies as devil worship and blasphemous and fear of these groups rose. Over time, many secret societies branched off by those who were corrupt or previously infiltrated by the church and gained more control through the church and large organizations that were being established. Today, there exist 13 families around the world who pretty much own the world with over 95% of the money and a lust for greed, power, and control. More and more information has become present lately that many of these families may have DNA that is different than the rest of the human population. It is speculated that they share DNA that was passed down from the Martian race or other species races. They contain no love or emotion and are completely power driven. This brings us to the end of the human history story for spirit science, but of course, it's not really the end. For one, we've only really scratched the surface of discussing many of these topics. Secret societies, for example, would take another two or three lessons to really get into. Plus, the human history story won't end because we're still living it, and what happens next is ultimately up to you. This story, while seemingly unbelievable and at times outrageous, does explain a lot. Think about it. We've covered the Bermuda Triangle, the face on Mars, Jesus, what the Egyptians were doing, the rise of Greece, pretty much most modern religions, the reason we popped up out of nowhere 6,500 years ago, the stair-step evolution of those cultures, and the story of Atlantis, which has been elusive to us at the best of times. It also explains the Great Pyramids and their connection to all of the sacred sites on the planet, the Sumerian tablets, the Emerald tablets, Lucifer, and as for the Hebrews, if you read their Talmud, it actually seems to suggest that they're not from here. I'm not going to tell you to believe it, but it definitely puts some perspective on many questions and aspects about the world 
which we generally just don't have conclusive answers to. Take it with a grain of salt though. After all, it is just a theory.